Good afternoon and welcome to the third Power of Arts and Sciences event of the semester. This series of virtual events brings together the arts and sciences community to celebrate the power of the liberal arts to transform thinking, spread new ideas, and positively impact our communities. I will serve as the moderator and let me first introduce myself. I am Lori Davis, CEO and founder of Lori Davis Consulting, headquartered in New York City. We are strategic planning and organizational design practitioners who serve a wide variety of clients across both public and private sectors. I am a member of the class of 1984 with the BA in economics. I currently serve on the Gephardt Institute National Council and as co-chair of the New York chapter of the Black Alumni Council. I earned my MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and my daughter, Chloe West, class of 2023, is part of the third generation and fifth member of my family to attend Washington University. In a moment, I will introduce Professor Clarissa Ryle Hayward. She will give a brief overview of some of her research, and then I will read from questions that were submitted by the audience ahead of time. Also, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens throughout the presentation and the conversation. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Hayward. Professor Clarissa Ryle Hayward has been a professor of political science at Washington University since 2007. Two of her favorite classes to teach are Intro to Political Theory, which is mostly for first year students, and Democracy, Theory and Practice which she teaches in the years leading to an election. She is also the Dean's Fellow for Policies. Her work in this area helps ensure that faculty in arts and science receive clear, consistent, and equitable guidance. Another hat she wears at WashU is that of WashU parent. Her oldest son, Aiden, graduated from the law school and her middle son, Eli, is pursuing his master's of social work at the Brown School. Some of you have may already read about Professor Haywood's research in the ampersand, the Washington University Arts and Science Magazine. She's an accomplished scholar and is co-editor of the American Political Science Review. Her most recent book, How Americans Make Race, Stories, Institutions, Spaces, was co-winner of the American Political Science Association's prize for the best book in urban politics. She is the, also the author of Defacing Power and is currently working on a new book tentatively titled, This is What Democracy Looks Like. Please welcome Professor Clarissa Ryle Hayward. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction, Lori. Um, and thanks to everybody who made time to be here this afternoon in the middle of a busy week, in the middle of a busy month. Um, I know it's hard to do, so I'm just really happy you're here. Um, I, the origin of this event today is about a year ago, I had a conversation with Claire Gowan, who is the editorial manager of the Ampersand. Um, I hope all the alumni here uh, receive it. It's the print magazine for arts and sciences alums. And she told me she was working on a collection of short pieces around this theme of disorder, broadly conceived, and asked if maybe um, some of the work I've done on what disruptive politics can accomplish might be a good fit for that collection. So we did that. And then in the spring, uh, Rachel Schultz reached out to me and she and some of the other wonderful folks in our communication department organized this more interactive event so that we could discuss some of these issues, which I know a lot of us have thought about in recent years and are such an important part of our politics right now. So what I'm gonna do in these opening comments is just share with you two, really two main ideas about disruptive politics and about what I think it can accomplish. And then I'm really excited to hear some of your thoughts and some of your questions. Okay, so um, I started thinking about 
this question of what disruptive politics can accomplish back in 2015. And this is when we began to see a lot of protests and other forms of um, of mass action in this country and also in other countries. Some of those I would characterize as disruptive. And by that, I just mean they disrupt business as usual. Okay, so a really concrete example, a highway shutdown. Um, another example is the main example that I use in the scholarly paper where I first wrote about this idea. And this is an action called Black Brunch which originated in Oakland, but then it was also used in a lot of other cities, including here in St. Louis. And this essentially involved activists interrupting brunch in fancy restaurants in gentrified neighborhoods and delivering a message about state violence against Black people. The point of the action was, and this is a quote from the organizers who came up with this idea, to quote, help black people across the US to carry the weight of their pain to communities and to people who otherwise never have to think or feel for them. So I was really interested in this and other disruptive actions as political phenomena. And one of the reasons I was interested was I would hear a very similar set of critiques or concerns from people about these actions. And people would say things like the following. They'd say, I condemn police violence. You know, I don't agree with the actions of Darren Wilson or maybe uh, Derek Chauvin or something like that, but I don't understand why the activists are blocking the highways. I don't understand why the activists are interrupting brunch. That doesn't persuade anybody. It doesn't win sympathy. And in fact, the critics would say it often makes people upset or angry, including people who agree with the points that the activists are trying to make. So in other words, to sort of use a, a well-worn cliche, the complaint was that disruptive politics doesn't change hearts and minds. Um, my argument in this research is that political disruption doesn't need to change hearts and minds in order to be effective. So it doesn't have to win sympathy. It doesn't have to change people's beliefs or their attitudes or their political opinions. And to make that argument, I'm going to, um, as I mentioned, I'm just going to try to share two big points from the research. Okay, the first is the following. It's that political disruption can be effective in the sense that it can help enact political change, even if it doesn't garner sympathy and even if it doesn't persuade people, if it sh shifts the terms of political discourse. So in other words, if it changes what the median member of the public is paying attention to and mm -hmm. changes the agenda for political elites. Um, so imagine, if you will, a middle class white American, and let's say it's late 2014, early 2015, this person, imagine, is not targeted by the police, and let's just say they don't really have a family member or a neighbor or a close friend who is targeted by the police. Maybe on some level, this person knows that there is a police violence problem in their society, but their attention isn't focused on it. And I'm gonna to return to that point in a minute, but, but for now, I just want to say, let's imagine that there's a disruptive political action, like maybe activists disrupt their brunch or they shut down the highway they're driving on, and it compels them to pay attention to this issue. Mm -hmm. If that happens enough, so if enough people are compelled to pay attention to something that on some level they know is a problem, but that they weren't focused on, that can change the agenda for political elites. Um, very concrete example, think about Democratic Party elites over the past eight years or so. They now need to address this problem. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to have a racial justice platform if they want to keep their coalition together. Mm -hmm. So that's the first of the two big ideas. Political disruption can be effective, even if it doesn't garner sympathy for those who are doing the disrupting, and even if it doesn't persuade people to change their opinions or their preferences, if it shifts the terms of political discourse. The second idea is that what disruption disrupts is mm -hmm. motivated ignorance. Okay, so that's a term that I use in this paper. And it's um, motivated ignorance is a term that kind of amalgamates two other terms that are more familiar and that many of you might be familiar with. The first one is motivated reasoning. So probably many people have heard of motivated reasoning. And this is just the idea that much of the time, most people are not 
sampling the world around them in an unbiased way, mm -hmm. looking for information and evidence, and then forming beliefs like little rational computers. Instead, we often sort of seek out and we disproportionately weight evidence and information that supports beliefs that we want to have. Okay. So suppose, for example, um, I have a preferred candidate who I want to win an election next month. Maybe I will pay more attention to their accomplishments and their successes. Maybe I will disproportionately weight blunders, even objectively small blunders that their opponent makes. That would be an example of motivated reasoning. And that's one of the two terms that I kind of combine to get motivated ignorance. The other one is willful ignorance, another common term. Um, this is the idea that sometimes people choose not to know. Sometimes people deliberately avoid knowing certain things that they don't want to know. And that could be for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but maybe, for example, they want to avoid being blamed for, for contributing to some harm. Okay. So an example that, um, that often gets used um, in discussions about uh, willful ignorance is a man named Albert Speer, who was a high ranking official in Nazi Germany. And he wrote um, in his autobiography that he deliberately avoided going to concentration camps and inspecting them and learning what was going on. And he writes, quote, from fear of discovering something which might have made me turn from my course, I closed my eyes, end quote. Okay, so that's willful ignorance. Um, he's willfully, he says, closing in his eyes because he doesn't want to learn something that would interfere with him performing his duties, turning from his course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, motivated ignorance, which is the term I'm introducing here, is like willful ignorance in the sense that you are closing your eyes, but it's like motivated reasoning in the sense that it only works if you sort of trick yourself. So if I were to say to myself, to go back to my preferred candidate example, if I were to say to myself, well, what I'm going to do as I watch this debate is disproportionately weight the successes, the good answers my candidate gives, and really disproportionately weight the opponent's mistakes, that actually wouldn't help me form the belief that I want to have. I want to believe my candidate is actually really doing better. Right. So I can't be consciously aware of this strategy that I'm reasoning in a biased manner if my motivated reasoning is going to do its magic. And that's kind of what I think is 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 the similar thing between motivated reasoning and motivated ignorance. Um, and here's very specifically what I mean by motivated ignorance. I have this idea that sometimes people are motivated to not know a very specific subset of things. These are things that um, that implicate them or render them complicit in practices that benefit them, but that also violate their ethical principles, okay? okay. And the idea here is it's not enough to know that you're ignoring the evidence in a way that you're consciously aware of. It's not enough to just like not know. You also have to not be consciously aware of mm -hmm. your ignorance. Okay, so I'm going to give you a really um, concrete example. Maybe somebody is motivated to not know about oppressive labor conditions in a sweatshop where their clothing is made. OK, that information is super, super easy to find, actually. So if you just Google, I actually did it this morning to make sure this is still the case. If you just Google something like what brands use sweatshops, you can find many articles and reports and lists and they will tell you the brands. But let's suppose that I really like wearing the clothing from one of those brands and I really like that it's relatively inexpensive. And let's also suppose that like most people, I want to believe I'm a good person. I don't want to believe that just because it benefits me, I'm doing something that I or particip I participate in a practice that I regard to be unethical. Um, I might avoid or ignore readily available evidence um, yeah, that the clothing I'm wearing was produced in a way that violates my principles. Mm -hmm. If so, my ignorance is motivated ignorance. So it's motivated by my desire to enjoy this relatively inexpensive clothing while also thinking of myself as an ethical person. Now, if you can interrupt my motivated ignorance, what will you do? You're gonna make me sort of confront this contradiction between what I'm doing and what I think is right. You don't actually have to persuade me of anything. So if I'm committed to supporting sweatshops, 
I will just say, great, you know, I'm, I'm wearing sweatshop. Um, clothing, um, but 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 so you're, so you're not you're not changing my mind, and you're also not winning my heart because I already feel and I already think that this is wrong. So the idea, and this is the second piece of that, is that if you could do that, not just to me, but to many people, some critical mass of people who like me already feel and think on some level that sweatshop labor is wrong, you might be able to exercise agenda setting power which is kind of like that first main point. You might be able to shift the terms of political discourse and you might be able to um, shift the agenda for some political elites. So I'm gonna just end by just giving you the argument in a nutshell. The question, the article I wrote is called Disruption and the subtitle is, what is, it's good, what is it good for? But what I really mean is what can it accomplish? What can it do politically? And the answer is it can enable people to exercise agenda setting power. So it can enable them to shift the terms of political discourse by interrupting the motivated ignorance of a subset of their fellow citizens. So that is the argument in a nutshell, and I'm looking forward to discussing it with you. Okay, excellent. Um, so let me dive into a couple of questions. One of them actually speaks to the Black brunch protests. And the question specifically is, what struck you about the Black brunch protests specifically when you heard about them for the first time? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a terrific question. And I really was drawn to them, as I said, well, first of all, I was drawn to them because as a St. Louis um, resident, I was paying very close attention to what was going on politically here in 2015. And um, I was drawn to these um, criticisms, the ones that I described where people said like, but that doesn't persuade me. And in fact, it, it might make people angry. And I thought that the criticism, it, it wasn't false. I do think that you you can make people angry when you shut down the highway or you interrupt their brunch. But I also just had this kind of, this kind of like this hunch that they were still doing something effective, right? And I think I really like that um, action as an example because it kind of separates out this agenda setting and, and motivated ignorance disrupting um, function from the hearts and minds changing function. So um, if you think, for example, about like um, some really famous um, political actions from the 60s, very often um, the, so if you think about, for example, like Birmingham, you know, like the protesters were very sympathetic and, you know, the Birmingham police were very unsympathetic because they were like, you know, training fire hoses on small children. And so I think that's a really interesting example, but I think too many things are going on at once. So what I really wanted to do is kind of boil down, like what specifically is the disruptive political work, the political work of disruption, as opposed to persuasion or something like winning sympathy. I can't hear you, Lori. Are you muted? That's because I was on mute. And oh, okay. Good. I, I'm glad it wasn't my during a conversation. <laughs> you have to tell me you're on mute. <laughs> so um, I, I apologize. Um, no, one of the questions that we received was actually speaking specifically to earlier protests. You know, historical protests, um, the Flint sit down strike and the Birmingham campaign and anti. Vietnam um, War protests, right, around draft evasion, et cetera, that were able to sustain, unquote, long-term militant disruptive strategies. But as the author of this question pointed out, we don't see that same scale of disruption in our U.S. protest movements today, right? Why do you think that might be? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. I think when we think about, well, first of all, I might I might question the premise of it a little bit. I, I, I tend to think about disruption pretty expansively. And I think the person who asked this question did too, because I noticed they talk about like draft evasion mm -hmm. or like a strike. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I would maybe challenge the premise that we see, or I would need to think more about whether we actually see less disruption now than we did 
previously or if it's different forms. I think disruptive politics kind of come and go in waves. But the other thing is, I think in general, it's very hard to sustain disruptive politics or disruptive actions for a very long period of time. They're costly. Um, you know, when you're when you're you put yourself at risk, um, if you uh, strike you, it's costly to you in terms of resources, in terms of your job. If you are evading the draft or if you are shutting down a highway, you face um, legal risk and even physical harm. So I think it's hard to sustain it long term. Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing I'd really want to stress, and maybe this is a good point to do that, is so the article is called Disruption. What is it good for? The answer isn't it's good for everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the answer is it's good for one thing. It's good under certain sets of circumstances for mm -hmm. making people pay to, for interrupting motivated ignorance in a way that can do some agenda setting. Once that happens, more work is to be done. So in other words, um, the example of, um, you know, um, um, a lot of the really iconic disruptive protests from the 1960s, the more work that was to be done had to do with negotiating legal and other forms of structural changes. So, you know, I do think like it, there's a sense in which you disrupt and you agenda set and then you move on to, you know, another mm -hmm another process or another phase, mm -hmm. the point of which is to act, actually enact the changes. So I think it's always costly. It's always hard. And I think it would be a bad strategy to just disrupt because you right, right. you can't do that for a very long time. Right. And, and I would interject that is our studies focus on the disruption and maybe less on all the setup behind that moment of disruption, right? Because the moment of disruption, the sit-ins and all of that, there was a lot of thought, a big agenda, right? Well thought out, well researched, et cetera, that we don't necessarily spend as much time studying to understand that these moments of disruption weren't in fact isolated. They were part of a continuum. And we also had people who were in place to continue the dialogue around the policy table right and 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 other tables but when we look at it from you know maybe what we've studied or what resonated with us it might have been the disruption and not the fact that it was part of a whole arc right um so yeah definitely absolutely i couldn't agree with you more and i think that um right exactly right. yeah and what well about said. the me our current media environment right um, question that came in was, do you think the agenda setting power of protest is constrained by our current media environment? Because that's one thing that's mar markedly different with, between this time and the previous times that were referenced. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I think the media environment is very important and it, and it was in a different way in the sixties as well, because it was, you know, television was the big, exciting, um, new medium at that time that was able to, you know, enable activists to do some agenda setting by staging these confrontations in ways that reached viewers, um, you know, through their televisions. Um, so now we have, you know, I think probably, um, you know, there's new challenges, but also new opportunities that are um, presented by some kinds of new media. Um, so I do think that much like television, um, social media and other new media can provide opportunities for amplifying and for spreading um, the agenda setting move. Um, so for example, I don't go to those brunch places, right? But I learned about it through, um, Twitter and, mm -hmm. and you can look at, um, YouTube and see some of these actions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that in some of these recent protests, you know, for example, Black Lives Matter protests, um, some of the things around the pipeline, um, activists have made very excellent creative use of social media. So I do think there is, you know, a real downside and a real concern about people getting a lot of their news from social media. We definitely saw that in 2020 and continue to see it. However, I do think there's also opportunities to use some of these platforms to, for example, document police violence. The fact that we have 
little camera, you know, little video cameras with us at all times has in a way enabled activists to make creative use of some new social media. Um, and also mm -hmm. just to get the news out about what's going on with a movement to mobilize other activists. I think that some new social media really provide opportunities in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I guess one last thing I'd say about this is, you know, compared with say, you know, 50 years ago, um, another advantage is it enables movements to be more decentralized, which I think makes it harder for those who would oppose them to kind of immobilize them by, by targeting like a key organizational leader. So I think that that decentralization um, obviously can be a challenge, but also can be an advantage. So one question that just came over, which I think is interesting, um, that, so I want to ask you two questions. One is a sure. um, couple different things, so it's complicated, right? When does political disorder become civil disorder? Mm -hmm. One question. Okay. And also, was the January 6th events, or were the January 6th events considered political disruption? Yeah, and I can see why those are very um, closely related. Uh, questions. Okay. So let me try to answer that first by saying how I would think about or how I would define political disruption. So in the article, like the academic article, I'm drawing mm -hmm. um, on um, some uh, various ideas, but including from um, a scholar named Francis Fox Piven, who talks about disruption as withdrawing um, cooperation from a power relationship. So, okay. you know, Okay, so so I would say, so that's disruption for her. I would say political disruption is withdrawing cooperation from a power relation, um, either with a view to or with the effect of making some kind of a change in political structures. And by that, I just mean something like a law or a policy or an institution. So maybe- So there's an end goal, right? The, the exactly, exactly. A political, to... Yeah, right, a political mm -hmm. effect. When I think of something like a violent civil disruption, like typically people are thinking about maybe like a violent act that causes injury or causes public danger. Um, and I would put January 6th in that category, at least, you know, the parts of January 6th that we're reminded of this afternoon as we as we um, as we watch the hearings. It seems there that the end goal isn't. Oh, did I just accidentally mute myself? How, yes, how you, long did. Ago? you did. Did I do that a long time ago? No, just, no. You just, okay, just good. <laughs> so I would say like, if the goal is violence, if the goal is um, threatening or harming or destroying property, that's, that's different from a political effect of actually getting an issue on the agenda in order to then negotiate and try to maybe change political institutions or reform laws or something like that. Um, did I, I think I also sort of answered the January 6th question. I mean, I think, I, and I should clarify by saying, I do not mean to be suggesting that political disruption only affects change or only works when it's done from a progressive cause. I think you could have conservative political um, disruption that agenda sets that gets issues on the table and that affects political mm -hmm. change. So I've, I happen to have used, um, you know, sort of like a progressive example as political and a more anti-democratic example as civil. But I want to say that that we could distinguish those two things. It's really it's really what's the effect of this action? Is it mostly violence and threat and destruction, or mm -hmm. is it mostly agenda setting and um, changing political outcomes the arc right yeah um okay here's a question that's kind of related okay what provisions slash protections does the constitution have for civil disruption as a driver of change it okay. is of course the most powerful tool in a democracy but also easily used to target protesters Right. Yeah, it's a it's it's a good question. It is, as we were talking about before, pretty, um, you know, as far as political actions go, it's pretty high stakes and risky compared with, you know, voting or or making a donation or something like that. Um, so I guess 
I, I should preface this by saying I'm not a lawyer and not a constitutional scholar, but I at least, you know, have, I think, some basic understanding that um, in this country, we have First Amendment protections, we can assemble, we can express our views, we can do that, you know, um, including by coming together with, a, you know, under a certain set of circumstances to protest. Um, but there's all kinds of things that we are not constitutionally protected. So my my participation in a highway shutdown is not constitutionally part, uh, protected. And the interesting thing is, I think a lot of the movement in this area is at the state level. So the question is about constitutional protections. And I would kind of, if I wanted to get more specific about that, I'd look into state consti you know, state constitutional protections and state laws. And I'll tell you that many states, like about half of them, including Missouri, have kind of upped the ante in terms of um, attaching more severe penalties to some of these kinds of actions. So, for example, um, there are laws that will make it, um, I think, a felony to actually disrupt traffic during a protest. Um, and then there's also been a whole kind of slew of these um, penalties that are that have been enacted really to target environmental protesters, like you know the the pipeline protesters, and they're using what are called critical infrastructure laws. So if the question is, you know, what are the provisions or what protections are there? Um, not a lot. Like, you know, at a very basic level, you have a constitutional right to protest, but there's a lot of wiggle room in terms of how um, state actors um, can constrain and limit your ability as to when and where and how you can do that. And there's not a constitutional right to disrupt traffic or right. something. Yeah. So let's talk about um, disruption and undocumented individuals here in our country, right? Yeah. Those who are interested in participating in, in just might be interested in participating in disruption, right? But their immigration status holds them back as they can face deportation or their DACA, mm -hmm. their DACA status, right? Um, how do we mitigate the fear with, of those individuals, you know, the undocumented as they consider participating in disruption? Right. Um, yeah, I think those are really important concerns. Um, you absolutely, I think, should, you know, if, if a person, whether because they're undocumented or because of some other circumstance is particularly vulnerable to the penalties that are attached to some of these actions that are not constitutionally protected, um, I would say, first of all, they should make sure they know their rights, like they should make sure they know their rights and what the possible penalties are. And, you know, if those penalties are unacceptable, I would suggest that maybe they participate in other ways and let more privileged people take those higher risks. So um, I don't think it, you know, I don't think anyone could ever like expect or say it's obligatory for a person to risk deportation, um, you know, in order to participate in one of these more disruptive political actions. Maybe they want to help organize the action and, you know, maybe be behind the scenes and let somebody step forward who's not at risk of deportation. And I think, you know, one of the, it's one of the really uh, tricky questions, and you and I have talked about this, Lori, which is like, um, how do you think about responsibility to participate in enacting these kinds of changes and responsibility for taking on risks. And I would say that's a big question, but like one important dimension is um, how privileged are you and like how able are you to absorb those risks? Something everyone should consider, mm -hmm. right? As you said before, um, with state, state laws being what they are and they vary state to state, you know, um, the constitution, says you can protest, that you said this earlier, that it doesn't say how, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that you've said several times, and I think it's worth repeating is, you know, there are a number of different ways that you can disrupt the status quo, mm -hmm. voting being one of them, right? You can cast your, uh, or raise your hand and be um, clear in your desire for change in a variety of different ways. If, 
if I can paraphrase what you said. Right. And just, you know, to even add on to that a little bit, like I was thinking about some of the protests here in St. Louis in the past eight years or so. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a large number of people and not everybody is in the highway. So if you're somebody who cannot afford to get arrested, that doesn't mean you can't be there. And like your presence can support and encourage and express solidarity with those who are doing those things. Mm -hmm. So there's really a very wide range of ways to participate. And we can educate ourselves on those. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the role that media plays, the the media plays, right? Um, In political disruption. What do you think? You know, one of the things you mentioned I thought was really exciting was that you, you characterize television as a new medium Because when you look at the 60s and when television was introduced, right, Mm -hmm. and the growing number of households that actually had televisions, right, that was a new thing, right? And that was was a a tool that was leveraged, right, because people knew that there would be eyes on and it wouldn't just be in the local newspaper, right? So Mm -hmm. in theory, the media still has a role to play, right? a role that we can welcome them to play. But um, I would just love to know a little bit more about what you're thinking in terms of, you know, the opportunity possibly that um, we have to leverage the media. And one thing you mentioned also was really important was, you know, we choose how we educate ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So we can actually probably use um, Google and other things to, better inform ourselves right but right sometimes too too often we're passive recipients right right and i think and i I do a little bit yeah i do even think that too often we're motivated to not pay attention to things because they're you know they're inconvenient right okay um and i noticed um there was also a question i think it's maybe it's gone and not very familiar with the technology. There was a question that I think you might've also been tapping into about the fact that the media is more interested in filming the protests than in sort of, you know, following up on what is the Ferguson commission doing or something like that. So I think those are all of a piece. Oh, there it is. Okay. I see. It. Um, right. Okay. So, so what role does the media play and like, what are right. the limits? Of that? Okay. Right. Right. So and the protesters, think- right. Yeah. yeah, I think the media is a tool, like from, from an activist perspective, the media is a tool to amplify the agenda setting, okay? So, you know, as I gave the example, like maybe I wasn't in the brunch, but I learned about it because it was really covered. Um, it was actually covered like in, in traditional media, like in newspapers and things like that too, but it was also really covered a lot on um, new media. Okay, so there's that. The so I think that that the um, that the media's role, the way I'm thinking of it in this project, is limited to sort of amplifying that um, agenda setting move by the activists. That said, and I don't talk about this in my research, but I can imagine a more proactive media mm-hmm. um, that is sort of you know trying to do the agenda setting directly. But what I'm really talking about is the media is sort of like a tool. It's like, or it's almost like a context within which activists are trying to do this agenda setting. Then what happens is, so if you go back to the 60s, so then you have, you know, you have the Democratic Party, which was a really contradictory bunch of folks. And, um, you know, this is a point that many political scientists will make, which is that, you know, when you have like a two party system like we have, what does what was what do these parties want to do with any kind of an issue that is disrupts their coalition? They just want to silence it. They want to push it down. So, I mean, the Republican Party today is a very strange coalition of people. So they want to message issues that unite the coalition and not things that don't. Okay, so um, in this, you know, mid-century Democratic Party had these white Southern Democrats who were essentially supportive of Jim Crow. And what the activists do with their agenda setting move is they compel the Democratic Party to actually, you know, take a side and take a position. I mean, another example, I mean, Joe Biden was a famously centrist Democrat for most of his career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if he wants to be 
in power today, or if he wanted to be in power in, you know, leading up to 2020, like it's just not an option for him to not have a stand and take a position. So I don't really see the media's coverage of negotiation as that. I mean, this sounds bad to say that it's not important. I think it's important, but I don't think it's important for this particular process. I think that what the Ferguson Commission does or what various political actors do as they try to sort of cash in on this um, change in the agenda by actually getting some legislation passed by trying to move the needle. I think the media should report on that. But I think that in this little piece, the way I'm thinking about it, their role is is a step prior to that. It's it's forcing, um, you know, Biden or, you know, the Democratic Party at, at mid-century to, to negotiate. Right. OK, I think we have time for one more question. OK, um, let me read that one question that was in the q a right okay. so the media cares less about what follows what follows the protests protesting like the ferguson commission than they do about filming the protests right and and i think what you're saying is that might be they're covering they're covering right and they're not necessarily leading with you know uh cares less about let me let me step back. I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to ask you the question, and then I'm going to be right, talking. right. So, so the media think... cares less about what follows the protesting than they do about filming the protests. I guess right. true false thoughts. Right. So I I think what this person is is suggesting, which I agree with, is that at least my, you know many of the participants in traditional and social, well, traditional media um, are not, um, the product they're selling is not, um, you know, detailed, thoughtful policy analysis, right? Okay, so I think that that's true, right? And I and I guess what I was saying is that I think that, um, do I love that? No, but I don't think that that limits the ability of an activist um, to use media in order to do the agenda setting role or the or to fulfill the agenda setting function. And then, you know, the work of the commission or the work of trying to get legislation through the state legislature or get legislation or get a progressive candidate elected um, at the local level or something like that is a separate step. So I think that that person is correct. And I would just sort of underscore that, yes, the role of the media is limited in this particular analysis of political disruption. But the fact that they like covering the protest makes it makes an opportunity. A tool, once again. Exactly, yeah. Right. Um, one, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna sneak in one last question. You okay, sure. How do you personally advocate for social and political change as individuals who are on this call? Oh, how do all the individuals on this call? How okay. do you personally advocate yeah. for social and political change? Okay. And I think this is not unrelated. This actually sort of follows from the question about like, what about a person who is particularly at risk? Mm -hmm. So it follows from that in the sense that I think for individuals, as they're thinking about personally advocating for social and political change, um, you know, there's a lot of different roles that can be played. And I mm -hmm. think the kinds of, of considerations that should go into answering that question for oneself are what are my important, you know, values? Mm -hmm. um, what are my sort of powers and privileges and talents? What am I good mm -hmm. at? Mm -hmm. um, and what's the amount of risk that works for me? So I, I like the example of the person who could risk being deported, but maybe you are a, the parent of a young child and you cannot be arrested because somebody needs to be home with your young child. So, you know, I think you have to think about like, what are the tools and the resources that I have and that I can bring to the table? And then I think it's really important to connect with others because uh, none of us can figure any of this out on our own. I think it's really important to come together with people who have different life experiences, different skills, they're willing to do different things and to kind of pull your intelligence and pull your resources. Because, you know, at the end of the day, most of us are not going to be politically powerful individuals, mm -hmm. but together we have more power 
than, you know, one politically powerful individual. So the thing to do is to figure out what can I contribute and who can I match my capacities up with so that working together, we can shift the political conversation and move the needle on some issues that are very important to us. That, that makes sense. Um, you have been a breath of fresh air as always. I really, really enjoyed <laughs> Thank you it. so much. I really enjoyed I, it. I, I enjoy our conversation. And um, I want to just make sure that um, we end with gratitude uh, for your time and your energy thank and you so all much. the work you've done. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. The next Power of Arts and Sciences event will be held on Thursday, November 10th at 4 p.m. Central Time. Aurelia Schwachter, may have butchered her name, let me apologize. She's Assistant Professor of Sociology, will be here to discuss her research on neighborhood branding. And you can learn how online rental ads may be impacting housing segregation. Um, a link to the registration for that virtual event will appear in the chat. And on behalf of Arts and Sciences at Washington University, I wanna thank all of you for a great afternoon. I wanna thank you again, Professor Hayward, and wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you to the um, wonderful people in the communications office who really facilitated this and made it run so smoothly and introduced me and Lori. It was really a lot of fun. That was great. It's great. I really appreciated having this opportunity to get to know you. Thank you, everyone.